Are you okay? I hope and believe that we are all okay. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Our scripture text will all be found in the book of Genesis, and I only have two scripture texts. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. Do you have your Bibles? Hello. Genesis 1, 31. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. Genesis 3, 1. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Let's pray, Father. We just want to thank you for your goodness. Thank you, that Lord. You have made us strong, and we believe in your word. I pray that, Lord, you anoint me as I share. I know the hearers of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. It is clear in our scripture text that God is the creator of the universe. And all that he does is right. And all he says is truth by definition. The world he created was perfect. The word he inscripturated is perfect. Every work he accomplishes is perfect. All the ways he follows are perfect. And the will he reveals is perfect. Just like what it is said in Genesis 1.31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. When God declared his finished creation very good, he meant that it was perfect in every conceivable way. Eden was the embodiment of the Creator's ideal intent for his creation. It means God wants us to go back in a situation like that of Eden because that was God's original intention for us. But what happened during the time? Satan assaulted our first parents to draw them to sin and the temptation proved fatal to them. The tempter was the devil in the shape and likeness of a serpent. His plan was to draw our first parents to sin and to so to separate them from God. Thus, the devil was from the beginning a murderer and a great liar. He waited for an opportunity to play his music and he found it. What did he do? Number one, he tempted or Satan tempted the woman. It was Satan's policy to enter into talk with her when she was alone. She was alone. And there are many temptations today to which being alone gives great advantage. It's very dangerous now to be alone. Secondly, Satan took advantage of finding her near the forbidden tree. Eve was near the forbidden tree. So if you would not eat the forbidden fruit, you must not come near the forbidden tree. If you don't want to fall into temptation, don't come near temptation. Thirdly, Satan tempted Eve that by her he might tempt Adam. Remember this. It is the devil's policy to send temptations by hands we do not suspect. And by those that have most influence upon us. And fourthly, Satan questioned whether it was a sin or not to eat of this tree. He did not disclose his design at first, but he put a question which seemed innocent. So if you want to be safe, you need to be shy of talking with a tempter. If you want to be safe, flee from temptation. The devil is persuasive and subtle. And the closer we are walking with God, the harder he will work to get us off track. Today, I would like to entitle my, my sermon, The Melody for the Heart. The Melody for the Heart. And I have three points today. First, the, de the devil and his music. Second, the crushing effect of his music. And third, Jesus the melody of the broken heart. 
Let's go to my first point. The devil and his music. Despite the fact, and we all know, that the devil is a master of music. The devil was a musician. That's why today, he corrupts music. But the music I am talking about here is not the music, that kind of music that we hear on radios or televisions sung and played by worldly artists. That is not the music I am talking about here. It is rather a metaphor. The music I am talking about here is a metaphor for the charms used by the enemy of our souls. It is about the trickeries, the lies he uses against us. Remember that the enemy never ceases playing his own music for us and against us. What are they? They are, number one, deviations. His first music is deviation. He plays it to distract or divert us from what is important. This one, this is one of the devil's favorite technique or game or ploys to us. He will say this, let them have their faith, thou okay man, and cherish it in some corner of their spirit. But, he said, don't let them pay much attention to it. Isn't that happening to us? We have our faith. We have our belief in God. But we don't really put much attention to that. He will also say, keep them busy with their pursuits, plans, and desires. There's nothing wrong with pursuits. There's nothing wrong with plans. There's nothing wrong with desires in life. But the devil wants to keep us busy over it. A day in the life of Martha illustrates this device. In, Math, in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42, I will read to you. Now it happened as they, went that, as they went that he entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, it means Martha approached Jesus and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. Martha was so busy. He was so cumbered about with much serving. Remember that serving is not evil. Serving is good, but Martha was so busy serving when she ought to have been at Jesus' feet with her sister Mary. Jesus chided Martha for being ignorant of the devil's schemes or the devil's devices and for complaining about her sister Mary instead of imitating her. Jesus corrected her. Mary recognized that what really mattered that day. Mary, Mary knew what is important that day. The Lord is in their house. The opportunity to be taught by Jesus is important to her. So she refused to be distracted by the lesser opportunity to show him hospitality. But Martha was so worried about food for the body that she missed out on food for the soul. At the heart of all diversion is the fact that the devil wants us to focus on lesser things. The devil wants us to focus on lesser things in order to avoid focusing on greater things such as moral decisions and the overall direction of our life. Secondly, frustrations is the second of the devil's music. You know, I was breeding dogs before. Pastor Lily gave me a Rottweiler, and so I started breeding. One day, my female dog was on heat. It means she's ready for mating. And I brought her for mating. After that, I fed her well and waited for approximately two months 
for her to give birth. But after two months of waiting, nothing came out. Utot lang. I was so frustrated. She looked pregnant. The stomach was getting bigger. She acted pregnant. And she acted like she was going to give birth after two months. Because she scratched around like digging a hole. That is a sign of, that the dog is, want, uh, wants to give birth already. But nothing came out. It was a false pregnancy. So I was frustrated. That can happen to animals or dogs. You will think that they're pregnant, but they are not. After, after the two months, it's like she pretended she had a baby. False pregnancy. The devil will frustrate you by taking away things that mean a lot to you. Or hindering you from getting things you would really like to have. I, I wanted puppies, but I didn't have it. So I was frustrated. In John chapter 5, we can see there the example of this man, paralytic man, at the pool of Bethesda. This man's predicament at the pool of Bethesda illustrates this device. For years, the man had been waiting at the pool, longing to be healed. But because of his illness, he couldn't get into the pool quick enough when the angel stirred the waters. He was losing hope of being healed, for he had been sick for 38 years. Frustration may deprive you of the best things in life. The devil is cruel in this device. Remember how he treated Job, taking away his farm, taking, taking away his beloved family, taking away his wealth and health? We should not be ignorant of this device because the devil will throw, in, will throw it at us time and again in an, in an effort to wear us down. His third music is pressures. Pressure. It is normal for us to have strength and weaknesses. Diba? Some people are good in academics. They can think, they can study, but they are poor in practical things. They cannot work. On the other hand, some people are good in practical things, but they cannot study. They are not good in academics. But the devil will make you overstress, overthink in your weaknesses until you become distressed. The devil will put on the pressure in circumstances that you are least equipped to handle. It might be final, financial problems. You are weak in that area. He will give you pressure in financial problems. He will give you pressure on quarrels. Pressure on lack of sleep or any of a hundred things where you don't function well. Oh, the devil likes to play in that area of your life where you don't function well, where you are weak. For example, Peter at the Garden of Gethsemane, when the soldiers came, he took the sword and cut the servant's ear with the sword. Peter was brave enough when it was sword against sword. He could, he could handle a sword. But later, when it came to a confrontation of words, and he had to tell the truth without denying his Lord, he just couldn't handle the pressure. He denied Jesus three times. So we should not be ignorant of this device because the devil will use it in every chance he gets. We need to be watchful and keep ourselves out of the trap that he sets before us. And his fourth music is discouragement. As human beings, and certainly as Christians, it is good to have high aspirations. We must have high goals, high aims in life. It is good. But Satan often seeks to poison that which is good. He tempts us to be impatient with ourselves or others. We sometimes expect to reach our aspirations in an unreasonably short amount of time and show a lack of charity 
toward others or ourselves. Because of our high aim, we forget those people around us. Some of us grow discouraged with ourselves or others and give up on the pursuit of holiness. Yes, we can, we can give up holiness when we are discouraged. Others give up on the church. They stop coming to church because of the imperfections found there. They have discovered some imperfections, so they don't want to go to church anymore. The pastor is not perfect. My leader is not perfect. Why? Are you perfect? The devil also discourages us with some open-ended aspirations. The fact is, there is always room for improvement. We must always improve. We can always do more. But the devil enters. He enters in. For when we have done more, we always think we have not done enough. Have we experienced that? We have been doing so much. But after a while, we thought we have not done anything. But the devil, and thus the devil discourages us, sowing unreasonable demands within us as to what we can or should do each day. The devil also discourages us through simple things like fatigue, personal failings, setbacks, and other obstacles that are common to our human condition and to living in a fallen world with limited resources. I'll give you an example. We went for a lab test last week, and our lab test result came out not so good. I'm not saying it's bad, but, but not so good. And you know, the devil could have used it to discourage us. When everything is not fine, you might be discouraged. The devil will throw his discouragement at you, will play his music of discouragement to you. In all these ways, the devil seeks to, destroy, to discourage us, to make us want to give up. And his, first, his fifth, I mean, music is deceptions. I almost say decepticons. Because I, I think maybe about two nights ago, I watched Bumblebee. So, <laughs> deceptions. Have you ever experienced or received a text message from someone telling you, you won a lottery? Who has experienced that? You won a lottery. Please text back. This is attorney so and so. Have you experienced that? Uh, I experienced that. So now, sino na experience <laughs> Wala. Damo sa ito na experience na. You know why? We are desperate of money. I was asking my wife, do, do Indians or five, six people only come to Philippines? Or do they go to US <laughs> and do their business five, six? And I want to tell you that all Indians, their height are the same. Five, six. <laughs> now, let me go back. I want to tell you my own story about deception, which I also fell as a victim before. Please don't laugh, okay? At my I was so stupid. It goes like this. One day, a lady called my phone. She sounded so professional, telling me that I won a certain amount of money. Now, I'm telling you this so that you can see and you can identify yourself because this is what is happening to us now because we are so desperate of money. So she called so many times until I was convinced. Oh, it's money. But she told me their office will send the money when first, I open an account where they can send the money. And secondly, I must send them some amount for the processing for that money. So I was convinced. As I said, I was convinced. I wanted money. I did exactly as she said. <laughs> Shh, don't laugh. <laughs> but after I sent that small amount of money, the call never came again. The, the call stopped. So I was deceived. 
So after that, every time I received a text, I still continue to receive text messages. But after that, I, I, when I still receive text messages from certain lawyers or attorneys telling me I won, I always say, into a ang amo para magdamo. <laughs> I am not stupid anymore. I will not be deceived. You deceive me once, never again. Brothers and sisters, if you have, dece- if you have been deceived once, well, rise up, but don't be deceived again. Kaya kung nadis- natuntuhan ka kaisa, aksidente. Pero kung nat- natuntuhan ka ikaduha, katuntuhan na gaya sa imo, ya? Hmm, correct. Dua man lang katao sa kalibutan, manugtunto kag tuluntuhon. Satan tries to deceive God's people today. The devil waits for opportunities to play his music or trickeries. And mostly, they are during the times that we are, number one, ignorant. The devil will play his music or tricks or deceptions when we are ignorant. Ignorant means lack of knowledge, learning, and information. When you know nothing, then you will be deceived. Anyone who neglects to have or to do what he is obligated to have or to do sins by a sin of omission. Hence, ignorance of those things that one is obligated to know is a sin because of one's negligence. 1 Corinthians 14.38 tells us, If anyone does not know, he will not be known. Nobody, wala sa may mapahilabot sa imo, wala sa may masapak sa imo, kung wala ka sang may nahibalan. Secondly, the devil will come to deceive us during the time when we are unvigilant, unwatchful, wala nagabantay. That means, you are not alert to what is potentially dangerous or not alert to danger or deception. You know, when predators attack, the prey screech. Wag silang ka-screech. Nag-ano sila? Nag-gatsangak sila? And scatter in shock. Nakibot sila mo because they are not prepared. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So without vigilance or watchfulness, you fall as a victim. Third, the devil will come during the time when you are isolated, when you are alone, having no one else present. Eve, remember, Eve, our first parent, became a prey to the devil because she was alone beside the forbidden tree. There is a saying, no man is an island. Right? And this is true also with believers. Proverbs 18.1 tells us, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. So when we move away, when we move away from the fellowship of the saints, and the counsel of the wise, the devil will set his eyes on us. You are a target. Fourthly, he will deceive us when we are fragile. Fragile means not strong or sturdy, delicate and vulnerable. Example, as I said, when you get your lab results and you are positive with cancer, positive with covid Positive with other terminal illnesses. Slowly, negative thoughts come to our mind because we are fragile. My, as I said earlier, my wife and I just got our blood test results. <clears throat> the results say we are very rich in oil and sugar. We could be millionaires. <laughs> Actually, we were rich. Our cholesterol was high. And our blood sugar was high. Isn't it obvious? 
And my other tests show, also show not so good results with my liver, with my kidney. So because of that, I may have the tendency to think negatively and be fragile. But instead, both of us, Pastor Carlin and I, just laughed at it. And we gave seven meanings to cholesterol. What is your meaning? What is your definition for cholesterol? We have seven definitions for cholesterol, our own definition. Number one, the first definition is Jollibee. Jollibee. Because we always go and buy Jollibee. Second definition, McDonald's. <laughs> when we are hungry, we just go through, we just go to McDonald's, a drive through and buy and order something. And thirdly, chooks to go. Kung wala kami sudhan, we always pass by chooks to go. And fourth, S&R, pizza and fries. Ito ka na, meet, no? <laughs> because every time we go S&R, we always come out with pizza and fries. We, our, prefer, our purpose, that's why I hate to go S&R. Because every time we go SNR just to shop around, look around, we always come out with pizza and fries. And the sixth, the fifth definition is angel pizza. You Thailand ko na dakpan sang highway patrol patrol group tungod sang angel pizza. Nagagi ko sa highway, hindi pwede ang kasi Pastor Lan, Carlin nagangkas na naog siya alang-alang. Pirogin kuha ko yagya po ang angel pizza. Hindi pwede nga mabilin. Six, kag seventh, Vikings and Yaki Mix. <laughs> you know why? Pastor Carlin has PWD discount. So we always have discount. And the best is, when it's your birthday, Free! So you go there, every time I think of yucky mix, yucky mix. I'm not insulting it, but you know, the result is like, it makes you sick, makes you fragile. Fifth, when you are curious. Curious. It means you're eager to know or learn about something. Very eager to know or learn about something. Learning or knowing about something is good. But in the absence of a relationship with God, Curiosity leads to sin. Since the person being curious will have sinful relationship with the object of their curiosity. So once his music of deviation, frustration, pressure, discouragement, and deception has penetrated our hearts, he will proceed, the devil will proceed to the next move. He wants to crush you. Once he penetrates you, he will crush you. He wants to crush you. That, that leads me to my second point. The crushing effect of his music. The devil will deviate you, frustrate you, pressure you, discourage you, and he will deceive you through your ignorance and watchfulness, isolation, fragility, and curiosity, and turn you into an apostate. What is an apostate? An apostate is someone who departs from the faith they know. The faith they understand and the faith which they previously affirmed. Apostate comes from the Greek word aphistemi, which means to depart from, and apostesontai, which means to remove yourself from a former place. Just like Judas, just like Demas, and like the disciples in John 6, 66, who walk no more with Jesus. When I was reading it, John 6, 66, it's 666. Oh, what a coincidence. An apostate is not, okay, again, an apostate is not someone who never knew, but someone who knew. He is not someone who never believed, but someone who even on the outside believed. He is not someone who have never behaved, but someone who once behaved according to the revelation of God but was lured away by the music or the trickeries of the devil. 
They were led by seducing spirits to depart from the faith. And do not be surprised. 2 Corinthians 11.14 tells us that Satan and his angels disguise themselves as angels of light. That is why Hebrews 3.12 warns us. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be any one of you, lest, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Apostasy or departing from the faith is not new. It happened in the history of Israel and the kings which led them to, be a, to a crushed and destroyed life. Let me give you an example. God gave Israel victory in the days of Joshua. But when Achan became unvigilant and took of the accursed things, the wrath of God came over the children of Israel so that 3,000 of the men of Israel had to flee before the men of Ai. The, men of the, the city of Ai was smaller than the city of Jericho. But because Achan took something which, which was forbidden from the city of Jericho, and they were, so, they were so confident to defeat Ai, they lost to Ai. Joshua chapter 7. Second example, King Saul. By ignorance, Saul had sinned by sparing the best of the sheep and oxen, which God had commanded should be utterly destroyed. God told him to destroy everything, but he kept the good ones. He said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obey, obey their voice. 1 Samuel 15, 24. And a second sin followed soon after. What is that? Saul wanted Samuel to act as if nothing had happened because of his disobedience and to continue to honor him before the elders and the people of Israel. Satan exploited the cravings of the people. Those cravings were so strong that even Saul, even Saul knew that what the will of God was. Out of cowardliness, he, dis, he obeyed the people and disobeyed God. As a result, God rejected him as king. Third example, Solomon. Solomon had been given a wise and understanding heart. So there was no one like him, either before or after him. But Satan deceived him because Solomon was fragile when it comes to women. He loved many foreign women from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, you shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after their gods. Solomon clung to this love. By this time, Solomon had already transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and the consequences came quickly. For when Solomon was old, the Bible tells us, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, 1 Kings 11, 4-6. Solomon broke the laws of wisdom, and wisdom departed from him. He who does what is evil in the sight of the Lord is no longer wise. Solomon obeyed his wives more than God, and that was his downfall. For example, in 2 Chronicles chapter 25, there is a story of a king, a king of Judah by the name of Amaziah. He was the son of Joash and the father of Uzziah, who was king during the time of Isaiah the prophet. He reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. The scripture says of him, he, that, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a willing or perfect heart. Amaziah, he functioned in accordance with the religion of Israel on the outside. He knew it. He understood it. He behaved by its ethics, but not with a perfect heart. In short, he had a heartless external religion. He performed his religion only on the outside. His heart knew not God on the inside. So soon, he was lured away into idolatry. The same chapter of 2 Chronicles, verse 14 says he began to worship the gods of Edom, to which he bowed down and burned incense. His life ended tragically. He was murdered by his own people. And the closing comment is that Amaziah turned away from following the Lord. Apostasy also happened in the church at Ephesus. That is why Paul wrote 
in Acts 20, verse 28 to 30, Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you bishops to feed the church of God which, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among yourselves, your own selves, shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. What's the application for this? When Satan works among God's people, he takes advantage of their natural desires and tendencies and the things that are appealing to them. He is very mindful of the things of men. He knows you. He knows just what appeals to people. And he uses this knowledge to tailor enticements to their individual weaknesses. Because if Satan comes to God's people as a roaring lion, it would be very unappealing. But when he comes as an angel of light with pleasant, flattering words and a smile on his face, then it is easy for believers to be deceived. And yet, no matter what form he comes in, diversion, frustration, pressure, discouragement, or deception, he presses mercilessly toward this one goal, which is to lead people into apostasy and destruction. Now, the devil is playing with our hearts and with our emotions until he gets what he wants. He wants them broken to pieces and crushed. He is on the attack today wherever people have weak point. He uses the desires and that are in our corrupt human nature as his weapons. He knows them very well. And he knows that people like very much to satisfy their lusts. He won in the Garden of Eden through his deceptions. And he wants to do it again by working through our hearts with his music or trickeries. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Because the heart is the center of our being, what affects the hearts affects everything. What comes from the heart goes, through, goes out through our behaviors and actions. And the devil knows that when he attacks and crushes the heart, it is almost beyond cure. Because from the heart flows the springs of life. But the good news today is that somebody's heart was already broken and crushed for you. Through his brokenness, he brings out the most beautiful melody for your broken heart. And that leads me to my last and third point. Jesus, the melody of the broken heart. Yes, it's true that Satan wants to break our hearts. And maybe he has, he has already broken some of our hearts. But Jesus is the melody of that broken heart. Hebrews 4.15 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Jesus did not sin, nor gave in to the music or trickeries of the devil. He maintained his purity by, of heart, despite the temptations around him. He was tempted by the devil himself, but he came out blameless. Jesus knew that Adam and Eve listened to the music of Satan. And because of that, brokenness has become the norm of human as well as the world. From Genesis 3 onward, the story of human civilization is nothing but brokenness and destruction. So Jesus had to reset. Jesus had to reset the music that human can dance to. Surely not, not one that leads to crushing brokenness. And so Jesus went to the cross as a blameless man to undergo all the crushing brokenness. He was crushed by the weight of the sin of the world. And his ultimate crushing brokenness was to be forsaken by God the Father. So that when we believe in Jesus' atoning death, we will be able to hear the Father's voice to guide us in the path of righteousness. 
Paul commanded us in Corinthians that when we gather in the church as often as we partake the bread and the wine, we are to remember how Jesus' body was broken for us and how His blood was shed for us until we can see the extent of that brokenness Christ underwent for us, we will keep attuned to the devil's music. What do you mean by to remember? It means to keep Christ's death in visual mood and not in audio. Because seeing is more powerful than listening. We need to see how Christ was broken and crushed for us so that we can become whole in our eyes to see the light and be whole in our ears to listen to the right music. There is that day when the new heaven and the new earth will come and say in Isaiah 51, 11, those the Lord had, had rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee. The music of trickeries of the devil that causes sorrow and sighing will flee away. Christ became the funeral song so that we can have a melodious song of the redeemed to sing in the Christ-centered Music to listen to. But right now, while we are still waiting for that perfect world to come, we are still stuck in this broken world. The good news is, because our Lord took our brokenness, we can have a melody of hope and joy in the midst of brokenness. Because Jesus was raised in power after He was crucified in bro brokenness. And so as the redeemed, we always have a melody of salvation. We always have a song of salvation and resurrection in our heart to tide us through any crushing time. At the same time, Christ's substitutionary death has mended our broken relationship with God so that our hearts today can listen to the melody and even discern the wiles of the devil because the Bible tells us the sheep hears the voice of the shepherd. Amen. Jesus came to heal those who have been broken and crushed with sickness and, and diseases when He came. The paralytic, the blind, and the lepers. He came to release the troubled in spirit, those who were possessed with demons. He comforted those who were broken and crushed with sadness. Mary, Martha, and Martha, the widow at Nain and Jairus. His three and a half years of ministry was spent proclaiming the good news and healing those who were brokenhearted. To bring His melodious work to completion, He died on the cross to bear all our brokenness. He died of our broken heart so that our hearts will be mended. His heart for our hearts. The Father was so pleased with Jesus that with, with what Jesus had done on the cross. Therefore, He raised Him and gave Him authority so that whatever we ask in His name, it will be granted. The Word of God says, Delight yourself in the Lord and He will give you the desires of your heart. Only in Jesus it can happen. And I just, I just want to share something to you about my life as I close. How the devil played his music to me. And I want to share this to you so that you can again identify with me. It was only in 2014, after my mom died, that I discovered something that really broke my heart in anger. We were trying, at that day, we were trying to find some documents to be used for the death claim. As we were searching, we came across an old letter. The letter was drafted, I think, in 1980. 1980. The year my mom and dad decided to separate. When I read the letter that our mom kept, and I don't know the reason why he, she hid it from us, I was so troubled. It was so painful to me. My tears started to roll down as I was reading it. And as they passed by, it even grew intense. I felt the pain for my mom because of what she went through, because of the separation. Stated in that letter were the terms and conditions of separation, which I felt was to the disadvantage of my mom. And she had to care to take care of us some more. As I was reading I did not just felt pity for my mom, but at the same time, 
my anger kindled against my dad. I thought to myself that if I was already a grown-up at the time, and I had read the letter at the time, and because I was not yet a Christian, maybe I could have killed him. I was so furious that I told myself, I will never visit him, neither come to his wake when he dies. One day, I was driving the van along Valeria Street in the city. I saw him with his second wife waiting for a jeepney. I did not stop to say hello. And why should I? Why should I say hello? I said I could, I could even have the van run over them. Pwede ko sila ipton, pwede ko sila mungguan. Now that is cruel, right? Very cruel of me. But that was I felt. That was what I felt. I was so vulnerable and fragile and easy to break. I wanted revenge. But one day, there was a Christian doctor who asked me while we were traveling. He asked, where is your dad, pastor? I told him, my dad is in Bacolod. Then he asked, have you shared the gospel to him? I was so ashamed to tell him that we are not in good terms. But his question was like a rebuke to me. Here I am reaching out to others, but I cannot reach out to my own dad. So since then, I asked God to heal and change my heart. I have been asking God to, to heal and change my heart. God knows I am broken. I was broken. And I also know He was broken and was as hurt as me. And I believe that what He did on the cross can give me healing in my heart. I am vulnerable at this, in this area. When you do things against me, that is okay. But when you do things against my mom, against the people I love, you will get it from me. That's me. That was me. And I hope and pray that God will change my heart. And maybe I sound like you. You're like me. I'm like you. We need to ask God to change our hearts because we were broken. We were hurt. We were crushed. But remember, Jesus Jesus' heart was broken and crushed for you and me. The devil may come bringing again his set of music to scare you, but it has no more power over you because Jesus' death and resurrection has removed the devil's turntable from our lives. You know, turntable, we had the stereo sang una, and then where you put ang disc sa old time, bala, you have to put the disc and you put ang needle and then matiyog tiyog ang disc. Jesus had taken away the turntable from the devil so that he can stop playing his music against us. The devil has no more place to play his music. And every time he attempts to play, Jesus turns the disc to the other side. You know, in this, my side, this side, ang old disc, bala, plaka, my three this side, and then the other one this side. The, every time the devil tries to play this music, Jesus will turn it on the other side. And he will play, Jesus will play his melodious and victorious music, the melody for the broken heart. Are you broken, broken hearted today? Let me tell you, you come to the Lord. Jesus has given you a, melo a melody for your heart. Shall we all stand and let us pray?